Hey, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well, wherever you may be in the world. And you're here for the Audio Programmer Meetup. This is the June 2023 edition. And I'm here with three fantastic guests. Uh, we have Marcus Hobbs, who is coming in from California. How's it going, Marcus? Happy to be here, Josh. Thank you. We have Harriet Drury, who is over in London. How's it going, Harriet? Hey, Josh. Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad quite warm. And we have Valeria, who is over in Arizona. How are things going where you are, Valeria? Also very warm. <laughs> Thank you for having me here today. Yeah. And I'm tuning in from Florida, which is also very warm. So warm all around. Um, so we have a fantastic uh, session today. And I hope that uh, no matter where you may be in your audio programming journey, that you find it helpful. Um, so today's theme is all about um, just finding out more about audio software development and how to get better at it, how to get help. Um, and we also have a Discord group that's uh, designed to help people get help with audio software developments. Now we near, have nearly 10,000 people in the Discord group. It's been going for the last four years. And um, it's audio software developers, aspiring audio software developers of all different levels, and um, we encourage you to join if you haven't already. Uh, so if you'd like to join our community, um, you can join us uh, at theaudioprogrammer.com forward slash community. And we also have a job board. So one of the things that we do with the audio programmer is we help to connect audio software developers with uh, the right companies. And uh, you can find out about the jobs and contracts that we have available at the moment at theaudioprogrammer.com forward slash jobs. And with that, we will go ahead and jump into our first talk. Uh, so our first guest is Marcus Hobbs. And Marcus is an independent product engineer who is looking for tools to help him get faster in audio software development. He's also a core developer for AudioKit, including helping on the development of Synth One, which has had over 2 million downloads. Uh, today, he's going to talk to us about large language models and using those alongside uh, frameworks such as Juice. Uh, this is a talk that I'm very curious about. So there's been a lot of intrigue about um, using tools such as Chat, Chat GPT and Bard uh, alongside your software development um, workflow and how useful it is and if it actually produces results. So I'm very uh, much looking forward to seeing this talk. Take it away, Marcus. Thanks, Josh. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I just want to thank you for uh, creating this community and this this learning space. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, I've been lurking for a long time, so I'm really happy to actually be able to contribute uh, to the community. Uh, with that, let me share my screen. All right. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. All yes. right. Cool. Well, uh, let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to be hopping around from a, a bunch of different um, pieces of software in this uh, talk. Uh, so, you know, as Josh was saying, um, um, I'm a product engineer. I, I love shipping products. I'm a, I'm a developer. Uh, I've created a couple of apps that are on the App Store. One is Wilsonic, which is a microtonal scale design, like a tuning uh, scale design app. Uh, I also uh, really proud, very happy uh, to have partnered uh, with AudioKit folks, Ari and, and Matt. Uh, to create Synth One, which is uh, a, a much beloved uh, open source free uh, synthesizer, has like Josh said over two million downloads. Uh, it also, uh, uh, I was you know be able to put microtonality, make that feature in that synth. So if you want to explore microtonality with amazing sounds, that's an excellent free download on that the, the App Store. Uh, my story is, um, uh, you know, I was uh, I've been developing for the iOS platform for a long time, but my creative process is in a DAW. So I really knew at some point I needed to go cross platform. Uh, and so I started that journey a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, I used this forum, the audio programmer, to start learning juice and to, to deepen my uh, C knowledge. Uh, and so um, for the last couple of years, I've been refactoring Wilsonic and just uh, trying to make that product available to as wide of an audience as possible, you know, making basically making it a, a, a plugin for the Mac and Windows uh, platform. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've been painstakingly like translating like Objective C, you know, Apple, like core graphics frameworks into Juice, you know, C cross platform, uh, you know, by hand or by brain, however you want to think about it. 
And uh, it's been a long, slow process, but it's it's been working. You know, the the app is out there. You can actually, uh, it's in beta. You can use it. Um, it yeah, this is it right here. La, la, la. So, um, anyways, um, in in March, as you all know, uh, uh, ChatGPT released you know version four of their their software, and that just the, took the world by storm. Uh, they they got like over a hundred million users within uh, I don't know weeks. Uh, something that Facebook, Google, uh, other platforms so just simply never could achieve. It just it exploded. Uh, and there's so many advances going on since then uh, uh, that this talk's already out of date. So <laughs> whatever I'm going to share with you, uh, the stuff I've learned in the last couple months since that first release of ChatGPT4, uh, the advances are just coming so fast, it's very hard to keep up with them. And with that comes just a profound amount of hype. And so what I want to do for you all today is to share with you what I've been doing for the last few months, exploring these tools, applying them to that task of making a product. And my goal is to make my code more maintainable, testable uh, for me to uh, ship more frequently and to increase my velocity and, and to learn, to learn faster. I'm using these tools to learn faster, not just code faster. So um, so again, uh, I, guess, I guess what I want to say is... Um, ChatGPT took the world by storm because... Uh, uh, it was trained on the entire internet. So it's useful for everyone, not just uh, audio engineers, although it's very useful for audio engineers. Uh, and so uh, there's a profound number of use cases that it, it uh, that it solves for. Um, so we're, we're going to limit that today, but, uh, but you know, you'll see me hop back and forth between different use cases and uh, the, you know, what this language model is good for. And I'm trying to, uh, I want to have a nuanced conversation about uh, some of its shortcomings and how, uh, you know, like it, maybe those shortcomings uh, are a big deal for other use cases, but maybe they're not so bad for audio programmers. So I, I'm going to get into some of that as well. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of AI. I have a slide that we don't have time for today, but, you know, I'll share the slides and you guys can dig into this stuff later. Uh, there's this concept of artificial general intelligence. This is where everything is all headed. Uh, this AI when AI can have agency and interact with the world and improve itself, there'll be a point where it doesn't need human interaction and it will just take off. And that's called the singularity. Uh, folks much smarter than I have talked about that and I've included some of what I think is really awesome and amazing here. I guess what I have to share with you guys today is we haven't hit the singularity yet. And so what I'm going to show you, I think you're going to be like, mm, yeah, we're not quite there. No, but uh, still great advances, amazing advances, very useful for us, very real, real gains for us. But we're not quite there uh, with the singularity. So you guys can read on that later. Uh, the specific kind of AI we're going to talk about is called a large language model. And what that means is it's a neural network and it's trained to start with a prompt from you, a text prompt. And it's going to respond back by generating text, predicting text, like what it's been trained on. So I, I, I say, hey, I want you to say something like this. And it's going to look at everything it's ever been trained on and come back to me with a response. But here's the thing. It's been trained on the entire freaking internet. Uh, I mean, the whole thing, everything, every piece of text, text has been hoovered up into it. And, and uh, I, I think as, as humans, it's really hard for us to understand the vast amount of data it's been trained on. Uh, so I, I think uh, a lot of using these tools is overcoming that. Don't, don't anthropomorphize uh, this tech. You don't try and put yourself on it. It's, it's just so big, it's incomprehensible. Um, also, I'd like to note that um, this version of GPT-4, it, it ended its base model training, I think, end of 2021. It's hard to know exactly when it cut off, but Juice has been around a long time. C++ has been around a long time, you know, even longer. And so I think its base model has been trained very well uh, with Juice. And of course, uh, as we keep interacting with these technologies, we keep improving it and reinforcing it and adding context and knowledge. OpenAI, uh, the company that just, you know, invented, built this, uh, continues to improve as we interact with it. So, uh, but I feel like that base model itself was already pretty darn good and helpful for Juice. Um, so large language models, the point is their response is supposed to sound correct based on your prompt, but it's not a calculating machine. Uh, these responses are not analytically correct. And so I'm gonna come, <laughs> I'm gonna give you this motto, <laughs> never trust it and always verify it. And I'm going to repeat that throughout this whole presentation. You're going to see this little never trust, always verify. Now, for use cases like 
I'm writing an essay in college or I'm creating a legal contract. That's a big deal. It might even be a deal breaker. But for coding, uh, whatever its response is, you know, we'll put it through a compiler and we'll see if it builds. We'll, if it has a bug, we'll catch it uh, with testability, et cetera. So this is a big deal for other use cases, but it actually isn't all that big of a deal for programmers, I don't think. And then finally, I'll just say, as engineers who write code, lines of code, telling computers what to do, that that's not how neural networks work. They work by being trained on data. And so we actually don't know what's happening inside. We don't can't really drill in. It's too big. There's tr literally billions of neurons. We don't know what those weights are. We don't know what that one neuron, what it what it means. And so I've included this quote by Stephen Wolfram, uh, who says, there's actually a lot more structure and simplicity to meaningful human language than we ever knew. And that in the end, there might be fairly simple rules that describe how such language could be put together. Uh, so I included this quote because I just want to impress upon you. We don't know how this sausage is made, but I'm, I'm going to show you, you know, prove to you <laughs> that it's incredibly useful. Uh, however it figured it out and however it was trained, it's, these are very valuable tools for us. All right, let's keep going. Um, so I'm going to show you some very specific use cases for audio programmers. So um, I'm going to show you how it helped me translate code from one language to another, Objective-C to C++, from one framework to another, uh, core graphic core to juice. Uh, I'm going to show you how to, I'm using it to write new code based on existing code. I can feed it existing code and say, now write me more code like that, but here, do these, this delta. I'm going to show you how it can explain to you what your code is doing, and, you know, i.e. documentation. And I'm going to show you how it can be very useful creating unit tests. I'm very surprised uh, how well that does. And then finally, I just want to hype this. Um, I kind of touched on this before. I feel like these tools are accelerating my learning. I feel like I'm learning faster than ever by using these tools. Um, a lot of folks are concerned about the educational use cases. There are folk, kids in school who are using these tools. Are they really learning? That's not a problem for us. You're really learning. You're a programmer. The stuff has to build and, and work. Yeah, you, you're not going to you're going to filter out all the, the the wrong responses and only keep the good ones. So, um, so I feel like it's accelerating my learning. Okay, so let's start with prompts. Uh, as a wall of text, I'm not going to go in it too much, but there's a million use cases. So uh, you can ask it to do anything in the freaking world. Uh, you can ask it to interview you for a position, like a software developer position. You can ask it to be a motivational speaker. I've tried all these. And if you don't feel like you're being gaslit enough by our current you know, uh, political media system. You can ask it to gaslight you. Uh, it's just incredible what you can do. I included a link to a library of uh, prompts for just a, over 150 different use cases. This will get your creative juices flowing. Um, okay, but here we go. So prompt engineering, here's the thing. The, the response that you're going to get out of these tools is as good as your prompt and as good as the data it's been trained on. You're not in control of the data that it's been trained on, but you're in control of your prompt and your coders so you should be able to write really good prompts. I've included some links to OpenAI's best practices for prompt engineering. And uh, there's also a free prompt engineering course if you want to go deeper. Um, I, I, I think out of all the users of, of large language models, I think programmers have a special advantage because we're already used to uh, expository writing. We're, al we're already used to defining our requirements very clearly. We're, we're used to thinking very clearly. And the more clearly you prompt these tools, the, the better the, the response is going to be. So, um, you know, create prompts that leave little room for interpretation, like code. Uh, use examples to give it context. This is very helpful. Like, for example, here's some code. I want you to do something like it, but a little bit different. Uh, repeat important information. You know, as you keep repeating a, a, a directive to it, it just reinforces that that's a priority and how it should respond to you. And then also it has the ability to be very creative and loose or no, very, very cold and precise. So tell it to be precise. For coding applications. And I guess the other thing I'd like to say is as programmers, we're so obsessed with implementation, like, okay, how am I going to do that? How am I going to write that? When you use these tools, you kind of have to let go of that. It's going to, you don't know how it's doing what it's doing. You have to really focus on what you want, like the result that you want. So focus on requirements and, and tell it what your requirements are. Let it, don't try and program it. Um, you're not writing code, you're writing a problem. I don't want to dwell too much on this, but there's a limitation with these current tools called the context window. So when you write a prompt and you get a response, that this, think of that as like working memory for the language model. Um, currently, it's pretty limited. So I, I can't just feed it a whole repo, the language model itself. 
there's some workarounds and I'll talk about those a little bit later. But um, I, I think as you guys, if you try and stuff too much, too big of a prompt and it, it, you're, you won't get results or it'll just fail, uh, that's because of this limitation called context window. So we'll, uh, there's, I'll just leave that for now because I, I imagine after this talk, a lot of you are gonna run and go stuff some code down it. <laughs> you're gonna realize I can't put as much code in there as I want it. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna cover these. I'm gonna show you examples of using these tools for these uh, use cases. So I've completely stopped using Google search. I just don't use it anymore. And I'll show you why. Uh, I, I feel like these models, uh, not just chat GPT, but you know, Bard being all of them, I feel like they've already been trained on a lot of the corpus of C++ and Juice. Juice, yes, it, uh, it improves, you know, and you know, major versions are released. But uh, you know, for those components of Juice that haven't changed that much, that it's already trained on, it's like rock solid. So I'm not going to show um, writing boilerplate code, but it's very good at that. Uh, so I'll just take my word for that. And try it yourself. And then it can fix simple bugs if um, they fit in the context window, meaning you're not feeding it too much code. Can't do complicated stuff. Can't you can't you're not going to solve race conditions and edge cases like that. But it can find simple bugs if you can describe uh, what the problem is. And then, like I said, I'm going to show you how to implement new classes based on existing class classes of modifications. Show you how to translate code from one language to another. Documentation and unit tests. So let's get going. So. The nice thing about interacting with these tools is you converse with them. So, um, so for example, um, I assume just about everyone here has tried a combo box, right? And almost every <laughs> plugin's got to have one. So, um, combo boxes kind of tripped me up when I was first learning, right? There's indices and IDs, and one's zero based and one's one based. So uh, that really tripped me up, and so I just said, "Hey, I'm confused by juice combo box indices. They always start at one." And actually came back to me and said, yes, indices start at one. And the reason why is index zero is blah. And you know, it gives me an example and it, it goes on and on and on. So there's just a lot of context. And again, don't trust, must verify, right? But, uh, but I just find myself getting so much context and examples out of this. I mean, you know, you all do the drill, right? You Google, you click on a million tabs. Now you got a million tabs. You have to go through each one. It's, that's a blog, that's a forum, that Stack Overflow is the wrong answer. But I got 20 Google searches now. I got a million tabs. Like I just don't even do that anymore. I just have a chat window open and I just talk to it. Um, there are uh, an explosion of tools happening. Uh, one I just found out yesterday, which I'll show you at the end, uh, where some of these shortcomings I talked about can can be worked around or augmented by uh, tools, uh, storage, uh, internet access, etc. Here's a project that I did. Uh, I, I took. It's a course I'm taking. Uh, chat with your G GitHub repo. And uh, Langchain is an open source tool set that abstracts large language model tooling. So uh, that is an incredibly valuable. That's probably your next step if you guys are going to start building on lang large language models or programming them. Uh, and it has a, a, a demo of how it uh, ingests a repo, stores that in a, a vector database, and ChatGPT now has access to that. And you can ask it very targeted questions about that database. And so I've done this with Juice. Uh, et cetera. And uh, it's amazing. It's just infinitely better than Google itself. So for example, I asked it, like, you know, I think you guys are the one audience that'll appreciate this question. What's the relationship of the juice editor to the juice processor? Like when you're first figuring these things out, right? Like you got to figure out what's the life cycle of all these classes, who owns what, uh, how do I make a plugin? And I thought this answer was really, really good. It says, you know, audio processor is a class used as a base class for all processing plugins. And the editor is a subclass of it. And I, you know, I'm going to fast forward. Uh, editor is created by processor when, when it calls create editor. And it's owned by the editor is owned by the processor. And you know, obviously deleted when it's deleted, et cetera. And uh, blah, blah, blah. But this is really cool. This is, it's hard to get this information in one place. Um, like even in the juice docs or even in their examples or along the forum, it's hard to get that succinct of an ownership example this class owns this class this is the life cycle is how um you know how you should make a design pattern for your plugins uh, here's another example uh with chat gpt hooked up to your repo i said uh describe juice processor and the various types of processor because i noticed there you know there's a lot of different kinds so there's audio processor processor graph plugin instance processor parameters value tree states players midi keyboard state and message collector so 
special bonus uh, homework assignment for folks is if there's any BS in there, please let me know and I'll correct these slides because I feel like MIDI keyboard state, is that really a processor? I don't, I'm not so sure about that. So you, you do have to be careful, but it, it is it is looking through the class hierarchies and giving these answers back. So um, there's a lot of nuance here, Could might have gotten one of these items wrong or not, but this is still like a step up for me from having to do this myself uh, with a million tabs open. So, okay, let's move on to the next use case. Fix simple bugs. So I'm gonna have a self-inflicted bug. <laughs> this is my prompt. So now we're getting into prompts and this is where I hope this will be valuable for you guys because you can do this right now as we talk. Uh, so very first thing I tell it is act as an expert, C++ 17 software developer, extensive cross-platform audio plugin development using Juice Framework and you're a cross-platform expert. Uh, and you have staff level knowledge and experience. You have to tell it how you want its response to look look like. So, and I tell it, I'll share a large C++ implementation file. And you can even put placeholders in there. This will make your prompts like nice and clean, right? Because um, you can refer to this placeholder many times. And uh, I'm only giving it an implementation file. So I'm just telling it, just infer declarations from the context of the implementation. And you'll debug problem, problem is a placeholder, and suggest fixes. And then uh, code, you know, I, I then I go paste this big blob of code and in the problem, my I am experiencing a logical error in my code. When I call the, this method, it's advancing the row by negative two instead of negative one. And now you guys don't laugh at me. Like, <laughs> it's a self-inflicted bug, but sure enough, it said in this method, this line is, is wrong. It's supposed to calculate the previous row index and the correct calculation should be this row equals blah, 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 mod, blah. So I had my mod math wrong. And again, this was sort of me getting tripped up on index zero, index one. So so it corrected my code for me, even put a little uh, comment that it corrected it there. So um, like I said, very simple stuff can be fixed this way. Um, I've caught, um, for example, when I would take my code from Xcode and put it in Visual Studio code, I'd get different warnings or different, or I get errors in Visual Studio that I didn't get in Xcode. It's really good at solving bu bugs like that, like, oh, um, you know, that tag my keyword is not available on VS Studio, but it is in Xcode, et cetera. So you, if you're doing cross-platform, it can help solve a lot of those uh, bugs as well. Okay, um, translating. So um, this is my legacy Objective-C code. It's gross, I don't miss this language uh, one bit. Um, and I literally fed this uh, to chat GPT, and this is the prompt, your C++ expert, Objective-C expert, core graphics expert, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to give you this Objective-C code, and you're going to translate it. And this is what it gave back to me. Actually, I have that up in the window. Um, and this is really cool. So it's doing the best that it can. And, it, and there's a lot of, like, all I did was give it a method. I didn't give it all the definitions of some of those methods being called by this method. I didn't give it any declarations. So it's missing a lot of context, but it still actually does the best it can. And it actually will tell me. So so this is juice, you know, uh, graphics, uh, and it's doing, you know, set color. Actually, yeah, that might be a BS right there. Um, and, for, and it's giving me comments like, for this thing, you know, this thing I was doing in Objective-C, it doesn't know what I'm doing. It says, you'll need to implement your own equivalent method. Yes, you're right. Uh, and then, it, you know, it knows how to dynamic cast, uh, you know, in Objective-C, the way you cast is different than C++, so it, it translated that fine. Uh, and it said, you know, I had a macro for general outline. It's not there in Juice, so it replaces it with this, et cetera, et cetera. And it did this whole thing. And then at the end, it tells me, like, here are the things that I couldn't do. So I thought that was extremely helpful for me. And I wish I had that two years ago when I first started this uh, refactor. Um, all right, let's keep going. I got about 10 minutes left. Um, and so I just want to show you, like on the left here is my iOS application. And on the right is, you know, kind of what I just showed you live is the uh, is the um, uh, the Mac Windows cross-platform version. So I actually am shipping a product cross-platform now using you know, chat GPT, it helped me accelerate this. It's a very complex, totally different life cycles, right? Totally different design patterns for these two platforms. And using this tool, I, you know, I didn't, I, my gut feeling is it helped me go twice as fast. That's my gut feeling. And so I'll take it two times as fast as good. Okay. So now let's do the other example where, okay. So I, I took 
some code from an old platform, put it in my new product. Now I'm asked to, new, uh, to add new features to my product. And they're very similar to the one I just added. So for example, what I have implemented is this guy right here. Um, and it works. I just I showed that to you at the top. And uh, this these are my requirements. What my big thing is I take uh, academic music theory journals and I implement them. So that's my thing. And so this is these are my requirements. So I'm going to do something a little simpler. I didn't want to start with something complicated and do more complicated. For me, wrapping my head, I want to go, okay, I have a really complicated object. Let me let me do the product requirements that's the simplest. And this is dropping down a dimension. So uh, how do, what do I mean by that? So in what I've already done, uh, my member variables are a matrix. So um, uh, you know they're uh, basically rows of variables, A, B, C, D. Uh, across and then their inverses below and you multiply them. It's called a reciprocal cross set, which is really important in music theory. And the diagonal is one. So that so there's 13 member variables for this guy. This guy's a lot simpler. So I thought this is a, let's see what chat could do. This is I'm making I'm, I'm taking it easy on on chat. So here's the prompt. So I said act as C and juice expert. You're gonna help me write this class. Uh, and I started with the header and then I the implementation I'll do separate. And I say, obey the following rules. And I told it to rename the class. I said, remove all member variables uh, called D or underscore D. You have a D in them, basically the, the fourth row or the fourth column, like you're going to get rid of those. I didn't tell it columns. I didn't tell it about reciprocal cross sets. All I said was, you know, remove these member variables, uh, you know, replace the base class. And then, uh, oh, sorry, replace the base class. And I tell it be precise as possible. And I tell it if you're not confident in a step, just leave me a comment in line, but keep going. Don't don't stop. Like, and then I gave it the header file, and the header file looks like this. So I gave it this header file with that prompt. And well, up here I'll, I'll cut to the chase. It it gave me this back. I formatted it and stuff. But I'm not gonna lie. But uh, let me highlight some of the things that it did, some of the patterns that it picked up on. And again, this is that Stephen Wolfram quote that I gave you. Um, these tools are really good at extracting patterns out of text. So um, they're not so good at computation, but they're great at pattern recognition. So when I told it, hey, make make this a base class. So this was this is the input. It, it changed that, but it also knew it needed to change the include file. I didn't tell it to change the include file. It figured that out. That's kind of cool. And then it did remove the argument to the constructor for that member variable D. So that's cool. So this is basically the top of my header that uh, screen grabs and just like kind of going on that. But so let's keep going. This is the rest of the header file. It removed these uh, member variables. They're not here. But here's the thing that really surprised me. I have some containers that contain collections of these member variables. And um, there's it, it, it knew to remove those as well. I didn't tell it to do that. So there's four containers for harmonics, four containers for subharmonics. It knew to, it figured out, or guessed my pattern, uh, to remove one so that there's only three and three, which is the correct thing to do. I don't know why it did that, but that's what I wanted. Now it could have, it could have, that could have been wrong, it just happened to be right. So you always have to trust. I mean, you don't trust, but verify. But that was very, very helpful for me. All right, so keep going. Now we're going to do the implementation. Now the implementation is uh, is huge. Um, this is the original file. It's big. There's a lot. Um, and then I'm just cutting to the chase. This is the implementation file that it provided for me. And again, I formatted it a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but again, this is the prompt. And then I same thing. Remove member variables like this. And uh, you know, a very similar prompt to the declaration uh, file. Uh, but some additional uh, implementation instructions. So let's see what came out of that. So one thing I thought was really cool was, you know, I have a description method, right? And it was smart enough to know like, hey, if I got to get rid of the D, I should also get rid of the trailing comma. I thought that was really cool. I don't know how it figured that out, but it it could, I don't know if there's a lot of code like that on the internet or what, but it knew to get rid of a trailing D if it removed uh, 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 a variable. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going real fast. Sorry if this is a little bit overwhelming. All right, well, now that I realize, like, okay, I went I went from complex to simple, and that worked. I'm going to go the other way. So so we we did the triadic one. We did the tetradic one. Now I got to do, you know, six, seven, eight. 
And these are explosions in, in you know, it's basically n squared like complexity, right? Uh, and so these, it's going to add member variables, uh, not subtract. So it's going to, we're going to kick it up a, a notch. Since I knew that, hey, I got to, I'm not going to just do this once. I'm going to, I'm going to do this for, you know, five, six, seven, eight. I templatized my prompt, not all the way, but a lot. So I started using templates. This is very helpful for, for you to phrase your prompt. So, so I, at the bottom here, I actually do the output class is called the hexatic diamond and the input class is pentatic diamond. And then the implement implementation is blah. And then that lets me write a really nice and clean prompt. And you could, you could, man, you could version control these and have a library of these, et cetera. And so I give it very specific instructions. This is where I feel like you all as programmers have an edge on other folks in using these tools. You're very good at this too. So, um, so anyways, I'm not going to read all these instructions because I only got a few minutes left, but again, notice that when going from five um, to six, it, it's, it, it told me like, Hey, I added a new subset five, I added a new harmonic set, et cetera. So it continued to add containers as I added a, uh, a new dimension to a, an object and it, and it correctly added uh, new uh, arguments to the constructors, et cetera. So it, it's, it's able to recognize patterns really well and extrapolate like what it should do. Um, all right, got a few minutes left. So I feel like I hand wave you that and you probably have a lot of questions on that, but I'll just keep going. Okay, remember how I said uh, my talk's already out of date? So yesterday I found this tool, uh, where is it? It's called Cursor. And so you're starting to see a lot of development tools coming now uh, that are, you know, like just not only leveraging these models, but also all the, the the guts and wiring underneath to to best take advantage of these these uh models so uh so i i so i'm using cursor i just discovered this yesterday and so i just highlighted some code and i said explain this code and it freaking gave me it i'm not going to read this wall of text to you but i've read it and i'm telling you that is absolutely right that that is really good documentation of this code and it it, it goes into great detail and you can even tell it, Hey, summarize that or make that simpler. Or uh, like, I imagine you can even say like, make it into markdown, but it seems to be, it's, it's very, very good at documenting code. Uh, the ranges of variables, the types of variables, uh, the conditions. Uh, I, I'm just blown away by this. So this, when we're all done with this talk and then, you know, what's next for me, I'm going to explore the hell out of cursor and just see like how far I can go with this. Cause this is crazy. Uh, the next big one, this blew my mind. Here, I'll just show you this one live. So I picked an object in my app that has the biggest public interface. Because I figure that's that's the best one to say, write some unit tests. Absolutely blown away by the unit tests. This is such a great start. So I have a class called Microtones. It's a pretty big interface. I don't know, you guys have probably seen bigger. But there's a lot there. It is, is a fundamental class to my app because um, it's all about harmonics and metadata about the harmonics, labeling. Uh, I want context when they're mapped to a keyboard. You know, it's just basically a way of doing arithmetic with a whole lot of context. Um, and it suggested all of these um, unit tests. So test the default constructor, test, um, I, I do rationals and floating point numbers with this class. So test the rational one. Um, all of these conditions look good to me. Test the copy constructor. Uh, setters, um, test octave reducing. That's a big thing in microtonality. Uh, test whether a frequency is a power of two or not. Like, so in fact, my only disappointment here is like, okay, you, that's an amazing start. Now, how do I fill in the gaps? Like, what, what did you, what are the edge cases and, uh, what, what did you not think of? It's, it, it's almost like you, I don't know, you get an A for effort, but, uh, you know, I, I still got I'm probably 50% of the way done on unit testing. Okay. Well, I want to leave some time for Q and A. Uh, I guess before we jump into Q and A, I guess the one thing I'd want to say to you is um, a lot of folks ask me, right? I see a lot of people fret, um, you know, like, for example, I have a lot of, I, I mentor a lot of folks who are in college or, or, or going into college, like high school students going into college. And they're like, should I even do this? Like, should I even learn how to program? AI is going to take my job. Or our junior programmers are really worried about them, you know, being on the chopping block because of these tools. I think right now, like where we're at is there's never been a better time to be a developer. Um, like I, it just, these tools, they're not going to write code for you. Uh, I don't think any product manager can write a prompt so precise that they don't need a software engineer. 
I don't even think we can yet. So I just think these tools are just going to help us learn and move faster uh, right now. And, uh, and it's just super exciting. So anyways, that's what I've learned in the last couple of months. I'll keep learning and keep sharing. Um, yeah, Josh, you want to open it up for questions? Thank you very much, Marcus, for that very insightful talk. That was really awesome. Um, I'm just going to bring it back to the group here and back to the group view. Um, so there are a couple really good questions. <clears throat> um, so trash code wonders. Uh, I never started a prompt with you are dot, 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 an expert, um, but I got the code fixed. How helpful have you found that to be able to, to tell it that you want it to act like a C++ expert that's trained in these different languages? So um, I haven't done like really rigorous test harnessing, A-B testing on this, but you know I've taken the open AI prompt course, I've read Stephen Wolfram's uh, you know, paper on how all these things work. And the, the value of saying, hey, I've actually also watched Sam Altman's uh, podcast with, with uh, Lex Friedman, which where he goes into some of this too, is the language model, when you prompt it, it it's going to, re its response is going to be, uh, however, well, there's a, not infinite, but wow, there's just a, a billion ways it could respond. So when you say, hey, act as this, what you're saying is filter your responses to to be like, as if someone like that said that. Now, maybe you're asking it a question like writing code where uh, no gaslighter on the internet has written anything about that code. <laughs> no motivational speaker has done anything like that. Maybe there's just not a lot of other ways to respond uh, to coding questions than as if you were that expert. So maybe maybe you're not getting a lot of value by adding that context. Um, I got, uh, But the TLDR for me is I, I, I just go straight to act like that um I, I don't i don't want to not say that and get a weird answer and then go add that i'd rather just give it the, as much context about how i want it to respond to me as possible I'm, I'm programming a juice application i only want answers as if you were a juice developer i'm programming a c plus plus code base i don't want you to respond in any other language any other way uh, so i feel like that kind of context is really important got it yeah makes sense george says uh, someone had ChatGPT design an overdrive plugin and the result looked copy pasted from a 2000 era forum. <laughs> uh, even though better code is free and open source, do you think this is a problem of data availability? Do you have any ideas why it may have chosen that one particular example? <laughs> any, any insights into why that may be? Well, this is why I kind of ended on the note of there's never been a better time to be a developer. I, we're just simply not there yet where you just say, hey, write me a website that does this. Like, uh, there's a lot of hype about that. I mean, that's the dream. And maybe when we get to the singularity, none of us have to write code, but we're, I don't, can't tell you how far away we are. But I, like, for example, um, I did not ask ChatGPT to write my drawing code. Uh, I'm an artist. Like, I care very deeply about how these diagrams are drawn and rendered all pixel perfect detail chat can't do that right i mean if if the concern here is it looks like a you know 80s <laughs> gooey <laughs> um right um so i really want to save the artistic creative pixel perfect thing for me that that's my value that's what i do um but i guess you know the larger point here is you know um you know are, are you how close are we to being able to prompt ai with simple prompts and get a sophisticated product. I think we're just really far away from that. I, I think, uh, and I think developers right now are in, in a really special position because we are really good at prompting and we are really good at being prescriptive about, and I think we can get the best results out of these models as powerful and limited as they are right now. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Warbly Head uh, says, um, how do you know the quality of the unit of the unit tests, uh, have you run any sort of co code coverage on the generated tests? I'll have to save that for a follow up session. Um, so full full disclosure, guys, I'm just going to be honest with you. As an indie dev, every single day I'm faced with: do I write some tests or do I add a new screen and a feature? And it's it's free software, and it's just me. So you guys all know which way I, I go. But now that these tools are 
making it easier to do that, I've become more interested in that. So I, I you know, next steps for me are to kind of add a test framework and start answering that question for myself. Um, I, I've been using, I'm very producer based right now. So I feel like to actually really properly do this, I'm going to have to like refactor my way I manage projects to get a real proper test harness. So that's kind of a, the next big thing for me. Uh, but I'm very interested in that question. And uh, as I make progress there, I'll, I'll circle back and, and share uh, with that. But I, I don't know. I do know that that was a very good start uh, there. Um, but I, I can't tell you how much coverage that was and how, how much further testing we would need to go to get professional level coverage. Yeah. Great. Ole Larkin. Hi, Ole. Uh, asks, Ole. What's up? Ole. <laughs> With the chat repo stuff, I guess you are using the GPT-4 API with your prompts, templates, et cetera. Are you copy pasting this into a browser window? Okay, so um, I, I did a little slide of hand there. So for the chat with your repo thing, um, there I, I, I'm taking a class and there's we did a project. So I'm using a um, package called Streamlit, which makes it easy to do chat interfaces to um, any kind of project. And so what I, the way that works is, um, so you have a chat interface by Streamlit. I type a prompt in there. This is really cool. The prompt goes to uh, round one of language model and says, hey, uh, he asked you this question. Um, you have access to the repo in this uh, vector database. Um, go search that database based on this prompt and pull me out uh, relevant bits of code. That's round one. Round two is you ship all that code with the history of your chat to another language model, it could be the same type, but a different instance of it, and say, okay, he asked this prompt, we got these relevant bits of information from the repo, now go give him a coherent answer on all that. There's a lot of nuance to that, right? How did that vector database retrieve that information? Did he get all the information? Did he get the relevant information? Did it only return a few results when it should have returned more? Like there's, there could be a lot of gaps there. So um, uh, I think that eventually, so basically, it's a workaround. It's very cool. It gave me some good answers, but it's that workaround is just going to go away when these context windows get so big that our entire repo fits into a context window. Right? We won't have to play games like that. Uh, and, and that's not taking long at all. OpenAI has announced uh, several projects where they intend to have like millions and millions of tokens that size context windows. Uh, entire like monolithic code bases can all be in its working memory all at once. And that, that's going to happen easily this year, I, I think. I mean, no, I don't, no one gave me a timeline, but you know, you see how fast this stuff is happening, right? And that's like an incremental improvement, right? To add more working memory. So I, I feel like, um, I, I feel like the value of it today, uh, whatever you think of it, I think it's going to go away and something way better is going to happen very shortly. Great. Paharo Bobo asks, have you tested results between the models offered by GPT 3.5, GPT-4, et cetera, and what BARD offers to see which are the best fine tuning results? So that's where you could tell them about chat all. Uh, um, can I share my screen real quick? I don't know. I, I feel like we're over a little bit, but is it okay? I just, I just going to show them chat all. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just real quick. So Sorry, Marcus, guys. I was, yeah, I was short on time, so I skipped the slide. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is awesome. So chat all is a really cool tool. I have it right here. Um, that lets you send a one prompt to many large language models all at the same time. So that interest that you have on testing them, comparing their answers, uh, you can do uh, all at the same time. So yeah, yeah. I, here's a screen grab. I was, I was trying to show, uh, anyways, th this is the interface. And uh, you notice I was testing my prompts on all of these guys. So, for example, those the same oh, later, the same prompts that I showed you to write new code from a template. I was testing. Sorry, backing up. Okay, so this is my massive prompt. Act as a C plus plus expert. Blah, and I fed it to Bing. Uh, Bing has creative mode and precise mode. So I was testing uh, those results. Uh, Claude is an open source model. I think it's really important to always test open source models. It did awful though. Um, and then Bard. Bard had a pretty, Bard results were very similar to chat for me, but it's going <laughs> to, your mileage will vary. <laughs> uh, hugging chat's an open source model. I find it doesn't do very well in coding. 
that's just me. Uh, chat GLM is another open source model. And yeah, so anyways, this is a way for you. This is, uh, I, I have a link in the slides. I just didn't show the slide, but um, this link right here is uh, where you go get chat all. Uh, so yeah, I think all of us should be very careful and explore multiple language models and to be able to do it all at the same time in parallel is a huge velocity gain uh, for that. Great. That is all of the questions from the chat. Thank you so much, Marcus. I know that's going to be of so much use for uh, for many people that are curious about this space using LLMs alongside uh, software development. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. Great. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and just segue right into our next talk with Harriet and Valeria. So uh, there's a little bit of a story uh, behind this, which is that while I was at uh, in LA or Anaheim, if you're being uh, more specific about it, uh, at NAM, uh, I met Valeria and she came up to me and she said, you know, there are so many questions that I have about audio software development and I just can't seem to find any places to get the answers. And uh, there are a lot of people that, that approach me about this and, um, and so we have the audio programmer discord that we, where we, uh, where people help others out with this, but, uh, but sometimes I think it's good just to have a conversation because there are times where the questions are a little bit more nuanced and people have more specific questions about their particular, uh, situation. And so, uh, I said, you know, Valeria, I have this great idea. How about we do something for one of, uh, one of our, our audio programmer meetups where we get somebody uh, and basically we can just have a conversation and just and just discuss this and um, and just have an open conversation about what it takes to get into this industry and um, people's different paths into this in industry and so on. Uh, so uh, I invited Harriet Drury, who is a, a software engineer at uh, Soundstacks. So if you're not familiar with Soundstacks, they work on the C major language, which is a domain specific language for audio programming. Uh, that's with uh, Julian Storer, who's the creator of Juice, and Cesare Ferrari and uh, Lucas. Uh, so um, she works with them and she's, but she's also fairly new to the industry as well. So, um, so I thought that that could be helpful because we hear a lot of advice from people that um, have 10, 15, 20 years in the industry. Um, but what about advice from people who have just got into the industry? How did they do it? And what's the path that they took? So I thought this could be an interesting discussion. So um, so yes, with that, uh, we're going to have a QA. and a um, So as I said before, Harriet is a software engineer um, working at Soundstacks. That's a division of Soundwide, which is formerly Native Instruments and Isotope. Uh, she's also a co-organizer of Dynamic Cast, which is a C++ learning group for the underrepresented under for underrepresented groups, holding meetups in Berlin and London. And that's alongside uh, Rachel Locke and Anya. Uh, so they're doing great work there. And uh, Valeria Starsek is a Arizona State University graduate and interested in building a career in audio. She will be speaking with Harriet to ask questions about getting involved in music technology. And with that, I will go ahead and hand the virtual mic over to Valeria and uh, Harriet to take it away and uh, ask questions. And if other people have questions, please feel free to chime in and we'll just make this an open discussion, and um, and I hope that you find it productive and uh, and helpful. Take it away, Valeria. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I will make a quick like comment on this intro because anything I've learned over the past year about the industry has been through networking and through talking to people, and I know that some people who are just like finishing their degrees in college or still in college and not in not even close to graduating, they can experience experience some sort of um, fear maybe talking to people. But it's really all about talking to people and asking questions because that's the fastest way to figure out what opportunities are out there and like what gaps you might have 
what you maybe need to try and do to get to where you want to be faster. So I have learned a whole lot over the past year, but there's still a lot that I don't know. So I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm really excited for this, actually. <laughs> um, Harriet, thank you so much for joining us as well. Yeah, no worries. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. It's nice to actually finally give back to one of these because I've always been one of those like long term like lurkers on the live stream. So that's not true. That's not true. You were <laughs> actually you actually hosted one of the meetups about that's true. it. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Give it back, so. yeah. Um, yeah. And plus you do dynamic cast as well. So you are giving back quite a bit. <laughs> Just had to had to call you out there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, fantastic work. Thank you. I was hoping to, like I said before the stream, to hear more about your story because I think that's always important. Like context makes a whole lot of difference, actually, you know, when you look at someone's life circumstances and where they are coming from. Um, so could you share a little bit about yourself like your background outside of software engineering maybe even before sure. software engineering sure so uh, i'm a recent graduate from my master's degree uh, based in london so i've been working as a junior for the last 10 months so i'm very fresh faced to the audio industry really so i sort of did the whole so before i went to university i did uh, a levels VA levels in the UK and stuff uh, and I did I did maths music and computer science and I did do physics but then you know it was physics so I dropped it but <laughs> I was going through my like rebellion phase and I loved playing the guitar and I liked being in bands and stuff and I was from like a super small town in Wales North Wales so I was like I'm, I'm gonna go and do a music degree um, I don't want to do a performance music degree. I don't want to just be a guitarist. I want to learn more about theory. I had this in great mind. I was going to be a composer and stuff because I liked producing and writing and stuff. So I went to uh, Plymouth University down in the southwest of uh, England. And they just sort of happened to have a computer music um, faculty there as well. And I, I knew that when I sort of joined and stuff. So I sort of spent my first year just doing like everything possible I sort of threw myself in had a great time played a lot of guitar played a lot in bands and stuff sort of acted as a self-employed musician and then when I was in my second year this was 2020 so it was March 2020 and we all know what happened in March 2020 don't we <laughs> so I, I, I was sort of stuck at home um, doing my university course and all of my gigs got wiped out overnight and I was like oh great I haven't got any money brilliant this is great what happens if this happens again you know like maybe I should go back to computer science and I'd been doing a bit of programming so anyway in my third year of my course I started programming a bit they had a programming module so we did a lot of um, Arduino and Max so you know very basic level stuff and I was like oh I want to put between Arduino and Max and it was like a really annoying sort of way of doing this and then my lecturer was like well, why don't you just learn C++ and go all in and so that's what I started doing and then I sort of ended up doing my dissertation on machine learning and music as a case study and then I sort of realized that I didn't have a formal qualification and enough experience to do this as a job so then I found a master's in audio programming basically so it was a lot of DSP I did like two three-hour maths exams in like a cold exam hall and it was like a very intense doing Fourier transform by hand but <laughs> um, which I've never done since by the way I just want to mention that um yeah, and so I moved to London from there with the hopes of networking and sort of reached out to as many people as possible, went to the audio developer conference and just sort of really threw myself into the whole world and then just started programming from there. Uh, and then I, I met Josh at ADC in 2021, I believe. And I was like, hey, I'm a huge fan. This is like great work that you're doing. And we sort of kept up a, a rapport from that. I edited my LinkedIn stuff and Josh went through my CV and sort of helped me quite a lot actually when I was applying for jobs. So I started applying for jobs during my master's. And then after I hosted the audio programmer meetup in May, um, Jules actually reached out to me on LinkedIn and was like, hey, we're looking for a junior to do all our documentation. <laughs> How would you like to write documentation for C major and sort of get into it from there? And I was like, yeah, are you kidding? That sounds great. Like, let's do it. So I started there about 10 months ago and that's where I am now. That's incredible. Um, so would you say your 
music background has been like key in this whole journey or how key has it been it's it's been helpful yeah definitely it's been helpful I, I knew what the industry looked like I guess from a product perspective I knew who was doing what I knew where where to go for whatever and I sort of knew what the big named brands were which meant that I could you know scroll down on their website and find their careers page and see what they had about so that was like from a you know super immediate preliminary stage that was great um yeah and uh, you know I get to use all these plugins and I know what they do and so learning the DSP behind was useful but other than that, I think even not coming from musical background, it's not, I don't actually, since finishing my degree, I barely touch my guitar, which is really depressing. I need to get back on that, but it just kind of ruined it. So I don't think it's like the most important as an audio programmer, but it's definitely helped. When it comes to masters, I'm actually in a really interesting spot because I'm considering doing a masters that's music technology, basically coming from computer science, but I wonder if someone is not in a position to do a master's, for example, do you think some of those things could be compensated with like studying on your yeah, own, yeah. working on some projects on your own? 100%. Yeah. I think the nice thing about doing my master's was that it gave me structure. That was the biggest thing for me. Cause like, you know, how I, sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this cool thing. And then it's like 10 months later and you've still not done it. So, the biggest thing I got for my master's was structure and learning. And I sort of really sat there for that period of time and learned GS and C++ and DSP. But if I'm being honest, I actually supplemented a lot of my knowledge with like LinkedIn learning courses. And I, I spent, when I was going through job interviews and such, I spent a lot of time on Leap Code, which is like a coding practice thing. It's uh, good fun and stuff. And I think if I if I hadn't done my masters, I think I would have still done that, but it would have been, you know, like a either a slower process or less focused and stuff. So if it's whatever works, right? Like and you say if people aren't in the position where they can do a master's, then I, I definitely think it's still possible, yeah. Have you come across any good resources, like maybe specific courses that were really helpful or really high quality? Because I think with learning when you're interested in something and you don't really know what you should be studying, it's mm. really tempting to just go for everything or yeah. you don't even know what to choose, basically. That's true. Yeah, that, that, that was another reason why. So when I first started my master's, my first like DSP module was like, it was just like A-level maths again, basically. And it was so low level. And it wasn't until the second semester where we put it into context where I was like, oh, that makes sense. So that was a good way of getting into it. Um, actually looking at signals and systems first rather than just going, oh, great, yeah, just whack it out in C++ until it works. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, learning-wise, other than the audio program, obviously. It's where I learned Juice to begin with as well. And Josh, at least your introduction videos were fab fabulous. Um, there's a lot out there, I guess. Mm -hmm. There is a lot out there. When I first started reaching out to people on the Discord, I had a really hard time like wording my questions, I guess, mm -hmm. because I didn't know what I didn't know, you know? And yeah. I felt like that was definitely a struggle because it's really difficult to help somebody when they don't fully know what kind of help they need. <laughs> So I think just that, exposing that's me yourself. every day. Yeah. <laughs> I go in our morning stand-ups and I'm like, I can't, like, guys, I can't get it to do what I need to do. Like, and they're like, can you explain it more? And I'm like, no. <laughs> that's that's been literally my whole life as a junior dev, is I get sort of stuck in a hole or something, and I'm like trying to dig my way out. And then I sort of explain really vaguely to my, and to be fair, my colleagues have been super good at sort of being like, you need to take a step back or you need to focus it from this way. But I think that's something you learned in time is how to structure questions. And it's so hard to ask on a, on a public forum, especially, you know, where everyone can see your question or the answers and such. So, you know, it's a very. Yeah. I've problem. had my. I feel it. I still feel it now. So <laughs> <laughs> if that makes you feel any better, I still get that. <laughs> yeah. It helps. I think it helps. Yeah. But that's that's the thing I didn't go into this with any background in music so I didn't even know what the companies were that were like in the industry what companies I could look at you know cool so what got you interested 
Um, my love for music. I just really, I had a conversation with somebody where it became really clear to me that I needed to figure out what it is that I was going to do with my life after graduation. And so <laughs> I really like forced myself to sit down and have an honest conversation with myself right. because computer science can be applied to anything. There's so many things you could be doing with CS. And I was like, okay, I just need to find something that makes sense to who I am and what I like. So for me, it was music always, but I didn't grow up as a musician or anything. So I figured I'd combine computer science and my love for arts and music specifically. And that's what I was going to say. I think it's really it's normal to spend some time trying to understand what the industry even looks like before you're able to ask mm. good questions and get yeah. good answers. <laughs> yeah. So have you, you had, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so have you been trying to figure out where you can apply for jobs and such things or like how to get into it? Is that sort of where you're at with it? Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions related to this actually. So when it comes to jobs, there seem to be zero entry-level positions in audio. I'm not saying it's like zero, zero, but there are very few. So if somebody is trying to get into this industry, how can they go about it? Because there is so much competition right now as well. There are so many graduates applying for new grad positions. Yeah, yeah. It's it's intense, yeah. So it's 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 hard when that because it's sort of it's completely situational, obviously. But what I did was cast a wide net. I had um, a spreadsheet. I was very organized about it all. I don't know where it came from from me, but I had a whole spreadsheet of jobs I could possibly apply for, and I did. I just went mining through websites for production companies or you know software companies and hardware companies. And I just looked for junior positions. So like, for example, Focusrite, they hire, I think they, they put out the hirings in January for juniorship positions. So you just have to know when to look uh, and they're open for a month or two. And then they sort of do code review and stuff like that. Um, but it's, you just have to keep looking. And then I, every time I saw one, I just put the URL into a spreadsheet with, you know, the job, location, salary, et cetera. And have I applied yet? Have I done a, a code test yet? Have I had an interview yet? Like, I, I think I applied to, 15 jobs altogether. It, it wasn't easy, I will say. I, I did a lot of code tests. A couple of companies didn't get back to me at all. Uh, I didn't hear from a few. A few of them I did the code test and didn't hear back. A couple I just got out and rejected from. Um, and in the end, I ended up with two job offers actually. Um, and I was like, well, this one in London suits me better and it's sort of what I want to do more. So I, that's how I picked it was in the end. but. It really, there is no like hard and fast rule, I think, for finding these positions. And something that helped me was having viewable code and having code out on GitHub and on my repo that was publicly visible. And it doesn't even have to be good. Like my first Juice plugins were, I mean, they're still awful. I've not changed them since I made the, you know, my uh, assignments at uni. But what was great about that was one of the companies I had uh, I interviewed with, they, instead of sending me a code test, they looked at my open source code went through it themselves and then we sat down for I think it was about an hour and they went why did you do this explain why you did this what was your reasoning can you explain what x means in juice can you explain what this means and then sometimes I'd get stumped and be able to sort of engineer my way out of a question or like through it and they, they wanted to see my process with it so that was the thing that sort of made the difference for me was um having some code out there or, or having like super simple stuff like just maybe write like a single C++ file with some like WAV manipulation, WAV file manipulation or something like basic things like that. Cause I, I think they, software engineers like to see things that people have done rather than just seeing like uh, someone's face on a CV or on a, a profile, they actually like to see what you can do. So that was something that, that, that's what got me my two job offers anyway, was having code out there. And when I sat down for my job at Soundstacks, I literally put, brought my laptop with me and I showed Jules and Chairs like some MATLAB scripts I've been working on. They asked me some questions about DSP and filtering and stuff. And that's what sealed the deal, I think. 
Mm -hmm. So what kind of projects do you think um, is good to work on if you want to build a strong profile, even if you're not in the industry yet, but you want to be? It's a good question. It's a really good question. I think, so mine came from university assignments, which was nice. Um, I think you kind of just have to be true to what you enjoy. I don't think you can sort of engineer something to be like, I'm going to make this cool app that does X, Y thing. If you have no interest in it or you don't know much about it, that's going to be super hard and a lot of work. So mm -hmm. the first thing I did was a distortion, I think, in Juice, which is you know super easy. It's um, a little bit of DSP. It's quite easy to research or you can ask on, you know, the um audio programmer discord or and there is also github repos out there where you can you know you can just search through github and see what other people have done and you can learn from other open source code which is nice so i think i would start by figuring out a basic task like that and then yeah if you have like something with juice that's good too and then maybe something my university lecturer said to me was don't put all your eggs in one basket don't just use one open source platform show people that you know what you're doing. So that's why I did some like web file manipulation stuff. So show that you can just like read an audio file and write to an audio file without any sort of fun bits on it and stuff like that. So I'd say just keep, if you if you wanna put open source code or put little projects together, just start super basic and do it well, rather than going for big complex mm -hmm. uh, plugins. And write How unit tests, you? actually. Uh, the, like, oh. unit tests. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do Those that. Are great. Yeah, write tests. Um, I was going to say, is there anything special about interviewing for a position in audio as opposed to regular software engineering position? Because I'm familiar with that process. I'm not familiar with interviewing for an audio dev position. So I interviewed for a, I, so I got a bit, um, when I was applying for these jobs, I was like, maybe what happens if I don't get one in audio? You know, I can't just put all my eggs in one basket. So I ended up applying for a couple of computer science ones that were, you know, C++ focused and signal processing focused still. Um, I found they were quite similar, actually. I think the bar in audio actually might be a little higher. But that's only because it's quite a competitive market, but there's, there's, there's a lot of grad schemes out there, isn't there? And they're very set with how they do training or how they want you to do a, a code test or whatever. I think you have to keep an open mind when you apply for audio jobs that it's, it's these companies that genuinely really care about their products and put a lot of their soul into it. So their questions are probably going to be completely different to another company's questions, which is something I think that's the only comparison I noticed, but I'm, I only applied to like two other jobs that was an audio really so not super mm -hmm. that. that's interesting because you also mentioned that you applied for 15 roles mm -hmm. and the numbers for cs graduates right now are like in the hundreds yeah, because that's how competitive it is yeah so yeah um i really don't know what to expect from this subset of jobs Especially in the US, I think it might be different or the same. I don't even know. Sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, I was 15 is quite a good number, really, when you think about it. It was um it's a great number. Yeah. It was a lot of code tests, like, but yeah, it's it but a lot of them weren't just software dev positions, actually. Maybe I should mention that. Some of them were like testing or QA as well because I, I was just like I want to be in the audio industry so I'll, I you know I'll do QA that's not a problem that's still you still have to have scripting knowledge and stuff like that so I, I just wanted to do that so there's a couple of software testing roles as well to boost the numbers um, but it, it is hard I think you just got to keep going with it I know that's what everyone says but it was genuinely just keep applying like keep putting yourself out there on platforms such as this and people will see that and be like oh this person's I can talk to this person this person is good at communication and they're outwardly speaking to me. That's something that's super important as well. And yeah, I think people like that as well. So keep doing well, what you're doing, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something that everybody would benefit from because really you just learn the fastest when you're talking to people. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask, have you, like how important has networking been on your journey 
well that's what got me my job yeah <laughs> if I'm being like honest it was like so important to me I um I got a scholarship for the audio developer conference back in 2021 when I was still a student because they run a diversity and inclusion scheme so I had a really long post being like why why you should give me a ticket and that worked um mm-hmm. and I spoke to everyone there I, I went up to people at booths and I was like hey I'm looking for a junior role I don't know what that should be yeah I'm still you know I'm still in education I can steer my learning towards things and I, I actually genuinely asked some of the software devs there. I was like what should I be focusing on to get a job what what things do you look for in candidates and actually everyone was super helpful and willing to tell you it's just like asking people I think and I had a couple recruiters share their info with me and stuff like that and I sort of had a chat with them it really was just talk to everyone that you can obviously don't you know interrupt people but it was like if someone is actively looking to recruit there's no reason why you can't go up to them and be like okay what's a good candidate for you what what does that look like? What can me as a student do to steer myself on that track? Um, and that, so that's why I asked, really. And everyone was super helpful, actually. Yeah, I think that working can, so like, important. it, yeah. And it also, you never know where it's going to take you because you never know what kind of opportunities people might have or know about. Mm. So I think it does a lot more than just <clears throat> excuse me and then just like having a conversation with somebody what about a situation this is me talking about my circumstances right now sure I am not necessarily in a position to be um, like playing the, the the game with the industry because it's so competitive sometimes certain circumstances kind of require that you get a job in something adjacent or maybe not even that adjacent just so that you have a job you know Mm. yeah so how would you approach that because I just want to make sure that I don't deviate from audio too much or if even if I do something that's it's technical for example maybe analytics or something sure do you think that could still be transferred to audio in some way i do yes i think um my example would be i don't hope rachel doesn't mind me mentioning her on stream or she might even be watching uh rachel who sometimes does dsp corner with josh she started Mm -hmm. last year with uh, she worked at heathrow airport doing stuff there and developing her c++ skills because she struggled to find a, a job in audio and she had all these well, she did the same masters as me, actually, but in a different year, we just sort of met at the conference and went, oh, my God, we did the same thing. Cool. <laughs> um, and then instant friends, obviously. So, yeah, so she, she did that. She went sidestep, but then kept her interest in audio and, you know, real time mm-hmm. safe code and sort of did a lot of work on her own. And, yeah, came to our dynamic cast meetings and stuff where, you know, it's I think and then anything that's sort of signal processing is in within within the realm it's it's not mm-hmm. just audio but obviously a large part of it is audio and all the fun effects happen in audio but you might end up working for a video company or something because it's very similar stuff so I think it's 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 easy to I mean I think Marcus you said something similar right about doing like this as a side job as a, a as a freelancer and then doing another job we were talking about it before we became live and stuff and it's like you've got, you can keep doing it and you can do it in your spare time and I know it's hard to do but you can still crack into the industry that way if taking another computer science job fills the hole and also th- don't forget it's, it's it's on your cv then as well and you've got something to show like every you'll still learn and it's yeah yeah i think also you uh, um what you'll get out of that even if it's not audio is just learning to work with other professional software developers or that's a whole culture itself you know um uh you know code reviews uh design reviews working with product folks analytics etc you know just um, that, you know, a, a lot of those organizing principles are common throughout m- many industries. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, another thing is financial independence. You know, if you have a, a day job, like I've done for a long time, uh, th- that lets me, uh, code whatever audio products I want. I don't have to focus on monetizing them. I can be as creative as I want. So that's another option as well. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I, it's really just the fact that the market is so oversaturated <laughs> with oh. all the 
graduates that were all struggling really, really bad. Yeah. With Don't lose hope though. You've got to remember what makes you, I mean, it's comp- competition and you're in direct competition with other people, but you've got to think about what makes you employable as a person, what makes mm-hmm. you personable. And, you know, you're clearly outwardly spoken because you're on this live stream and such. So it's, it's great things to have. Um, it is competitive, but it's definitely a good place to be. And as Marcus said earlier, there's no greater time to be a programmer, audio programmer. So <laughs> he's right. What about working on art? How would you say, like, could that be beneficial in addition to coding? Or maybe if you're doing coding in the art art context, because for example, I do have that um, in my life and that's basically one way for me to use my coding skills and build on top of what I already know. So do you think that could be something to leverage? Sure. Are you talking sort of like um, creative computing and building yeah. art? And so, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's a whole industry in itself. I, I see mm-hmm. when I go to museums, I love museums. It's another reason why I like living in London, but I went to the Barbican Centre in London and they had a whole installation called this to our time on earth and it was completely interactive and they'd hired someone who worked with the unreal engine to build something and that was an art installation but obviously i mean the chap runs his own limited company doing that thing and that's his whole job was to be a coder and to create art and obviously probably i don't know what his day-to-day looks like but as a contractor he he was within that and i know that's more video than audio as well but all these skills work together don't they but yeah I know a couple of people who do sort of things like that. And that is another side. I'd say it's probably harder to have a job doing that, but freelance, that's a very nice role to have and very fulfilling, I guess, as an artist. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. Yeah. Have you had any mentors on your path? Josh. (laughs) Josh has uh, been great. (laughs) Um. I mean, my lecturers were good. My my current mentors, obviously, my my bosses, everyone at Sandstacks, they've been sort of mentors for me, and they give me code reviews all the time and tell me where I can improve and what to do. Um, Anya from Dynamic Cast and Rachel themselves, they've been really good. I mean, Anya's fantastic, um, and sort of that whole group. So when when I started Dynamic Cast, I was still a student. We well, started it in London. We started it about a year ago, and I was sort of student, but I was organising it. But I got to talk to all these senior devs and sort of middleweight devs, and that was really useful actually because they sort of like told me how to auto format some things. That, you know, things that are super basic that don't really get taught at university level. So my mentors were sort of my peers really, or people a couple of years ahead of me and things like that. And I, I found that super useful. Oh. You, should, you should join us you, you're more than welcome we do uh live streams yeah i was pizza. i was going to say that <laughs> question for later yeah yeah that, that would be awesome of course of course how would you say like what is a way to get the most out of your experience with somebody as a mentor like how do you ask the right questions or how do you approach that sort of relationship in an efficient way? Good question. Go at it with an open mind, I guess. You won't know things that you need to know yet, and that's fine. Like auto formatting, it was the thing that I learned about and saved me a lot of time. I can press control S and it will do it for me. <laughs> um, but things like that, I guess, having a mentor and doing a mentorship process or program is nice because, like, I mean, I've never done an official process like this, but if you're sharing code with someone, they're going to be a mentor or a peer, aren't they? Because they're going to look at your code and they'll see it and be like, hey, why don't you try this? I guess keep an open mind. And if someone comments on your code, maybe look into what they were saying or ask them to explain further or go through some online documentation or go through Godbolt. I mean, I use Godbolt a lot to go through stuff and understand that uh, I'm not doing stuff very efficiently. Stuff like that. So I guess keep an open mind. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that you wish you would have known when you were looking for a job and didn't have a job yet? Um, yeah, I guess I wish I'd known 
more about how important these soft skills are and being able to communicate, like you say, a problem and um, being able to rub it up things, I guess. That's the biggest thing I've learned in the last 10 months, I think is, I mean, I mean I've mean, i learned tons about programming, don't get me wrong. I think the step level when you get your first job is exponential because you're working with production code, obviously. So, you know, it needs to be good. Otherwise people aren't happy or you're, you're inefficient or you're making mistakes. So in terms of code level, that just takes off. And it was these soft skills where I really struggled when I first began to explain the problems I was facing and, like my peers would, or my colleagues would get confused. I'd say to them, they'd be like, you're not explaining that very well. You need to like take a step back. And they were very good at sort of asking the right questions to get me there. So I think being able to do that, like, I mean, they call it rubber ducking where you to talk to a rubber duck and try and figure out how to ask a question or how you break it down. And I think that's the, the thing I wish I'd known how to do more is breaking down a problem. Mm -hmm. that's, an, that's really interesting. I, I was thinking about that during the first half of our stream today when it comes to prompts and like being able to word your question so well yeah. so that you get exactly what you're looking for. And I think, yeah, it is a skill for sure. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, I guess you can practice that with chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no more rubber ducks. <laughs> you know? Just chat GPT. Yeah. Um, I just, just want to... Um, plus one to what Harriet said about soft skills. There's a lot of different uh, words for that. Uh, another phrase would be like being coachable. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like uh, when you when you get on a team and there's folks with a little bit more experience, you know, than you, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, everything Harriet described is exactly what I'm, you know, kind of talking about, like learning how to communicate really effectively, being respectful of their time. Uh, in terms of mentors, like if you, if, if you're in a, uh, a workplace where there's a formal mentor, you know, where a manager says, yeah, hey, I want this person to be your mentor. Because uh, typically when you onboard, there's at least some kind of onboarding buddy or something. Uh, setting up like a weekly meeting with that person, you know, having a, an agenda, uh, that that's always good. But once you're inside a professional environment, like uh, these days in tech, like uh, communication platforms like Slack are, are really popular with business. What I always advised uh, uh, new grad hires or junior devs was the, here are the top players on our team. Just in Slack, go find that top player and look at that person's conversation history. They're everywhere. They're all over the place. Like, go follow them. Uh, lots of businesses will have um, time sensitive, like uh, protocols for when something bad happens, like there's a downtime or something. You know, last place I worked called them site incidents. And usually the most senior folks, uh, you know, lead those, you know, how to resolve those, you taking the initiative to like jump in on those and take advantage of those because those are learning opportunities and watching how those senior folks resolve very difficult uh, uh, like problems is, is it's like a passive mentorship, right? You are actively looking for the most important issues going on in that business and following along. Uh, that was harder to do before things like Slack, and it's just so easy now. So uh, those are lots of tips that I give new engineers to to teams to jumpstart, you know, just get get in the mix, find out yeah. who's who, and you'll find out for yourself who should be your mentor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you don't have to know everything either. Like, yeah. It's, it's, it's great to ask questions. And I think I think my, my colleagues definitely like me asking more questions and then knowing what I'm meant to be doing more. That's something I've noticed as well. But like explain to us what you're doing more like we can help you if we can break it down and do that mm -hmm. i love that point about giving context uh, when you're facing a problem uh, even like seniors don't know what you're dealing with right like they for you to break it down i'm just very yeah mm -hmm. i'm tasked with this problem this is the context that really helps them help you so those are great skills to have it, yeah and it's been like really hard because we all well we work remotely mostly and we go into the office like one one day a week generally speaking so i i you know i sit alone at my desk and I'm just programming and it's, it's, it's really hard in that situation because as a junior, it's nice to be able to read someone's code or watch them code because you get to watch. So sometimes I do like a one-to-one -one Slack call with one of my colleagues and they will program or, you know, I'll, I'll tell them problem I'm working on and they'll sort of program a bit and I'll be like, so why have you done that? And it's, it's something that's more important, I think, now that, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, work isn't quite so dominant anymore. Yeah, plus one to that too. Uh, you have to make an extra special effort to reach out and communicate when uh, your team is uh, has a remote component. You know, the more remote it is, the more effort and, and more intention you have to have to make that connection. 
um, that you, you would normally get by just rubbing shoulders in an office. So. Yeah, which also that should be your goal as well. You shouldn't just jump into a job because it sounds good on paper. Like when you do the interview, don't forget that you're looking at them as a company as well. Yeah. Okay. So, so you want that. So you want to be able to feel like you can ask questions because otherwise, what you know, what are you getting from it? How are you going to become a better programmer if you can't feel like you can ask these questions? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry. No, no, Where please. I was going to say, so how were you able to, like, what was your process of adjusting to this new environment as a new employee when I think it's common to feel slightly intimidated, like it's not your place to be making any suggestions or, Oh yeah, you know. 100%. Yeah. It's like, I've just hopped in, like, why am I making, I think being in the right environment, it's it gets easier. I think when I, so when I first started, I was like, a, "What's going on?" You know, I, I jumped into Sandwide, although I am in Sandstacks. So I get all these colleagues and across the world who uh, I can talk to and stuff, and they're doing stuff at C Major. And I was like, "Who am I to suggest what we do?" Because I've just started. I, you know, I don't know. Jewel, I mean, it's Julian Store. Like, you know, I can't. What am I suggesting to Jules that he doesn't already know? Um, but no, it, it becomes quite easy after a while, rapport and stuff. And you find out these guys are lovely. And I mean, I've taken, they've they've just given me my first sort of project where I'm sort of leading it. And they're just sort of like, I, I give them, you know, we have a morning stand up and I give them an update on what I'm doing. And, but they sort of largely leave me to do that. And I, if I can explain what I'm doing, that's important to them. But it's sort of over time that becomes more and more. So when I first started, when we were doing this, so when we wrote our documentation, We've got a self-documentating. It's like like Doxygen, basically. We wrote our own sort of uh, C plus plus script that can take our code from our standard library and produce a web page and stuff. So, so for example, Jules wrote all the initial C plus plus for that, and I sort of fine tweaked it. And then we had code reviews on that, and we sort of went through uh, what could be better. Um, and that's where I started. And then sort of slowly, more slowly and slowly, I started doing things on my own more and more. So I started. Um, I don't know if you guys were the UC major, but there's like a graphing. Uh, piece on the VS Code panel. I, I wrote that and stuff with Jules's help, and he helped me loads with that. And then, yeah, so this next project I've been working on, I've sort of been doing it solo, but with like help from all the devs when I get stuck, which is a lot of the time. <laughs> so it, 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 all I'm trying to say, I guess, is that it, it, it gets it starts quite intense, but then you can make more suggestions that goes, and you sort of learn more about the company and what things should be suggested and stuff. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's really interesting. How much, I, I don't know if collaboration is the proper term, but how much do you have to engage with other people throughout your week? Because that's, al- that's always been interesting to me because I do like collaboration personally, and I would want to be in an environment where, like, even if I'm working on code, I still have a team that appreciates interaction, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have a ton of interaction with other people. I sort of chat to my team and that's what I do. I'm not sort of needed to talk to other parts of the company and stuff, but if I'm in the office and I see anyone from the NI side or something, I will say hi and we'll have a chat about what they're doing. One of the um, product creators is like dabbles in like Max MSP and every time I see him, he tells me about what he's been doing and sort of wants my input. Um, actually, he's writing a try term thing actually. Maybe I should point them to you, Marcus. Um, <laughs> and um, collaboration, I mean, I've been offered a couple of times. So Lucas, one of my colleagues was like, yeah, we can do more pair programming if you'd like, where we write, we find a problem and we code and then we compare and see what we learn and stuff like that. So um, I guess I do a lot of collaboration with my team, but not so much the art company, mm-hmm. which I like because we're all software devs, so we all get it. <laughs> Hmm. I could interject with a couple uh, comments and questions. Uh, one question from uh, from our live chat. So, um, what, just looking, just looking through. So, one question that was uh, for for Harriet. Uh, you had said that you had some code that you showed along with your CV. Can you just talk a little bit about? kind of what it was what and what level it was yeah, at. Sure. 
sure. Yeah, I can go into specifics. So I sort of wrote a noddy website for like, here's my undergrad dissertation, which isn't great now, but was fine at the time. <laughs> um, so I, I have a GitHub page, like I'm sure a lot of people do. And I just sort of, when I was doing my course, actually, I just made, I set up Git. I'd not used Git before, so I started using source control and stuff like that. And I was just pushing to it as I was going. Um, and also, so when I was done with it, I, 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 I um, didn't, you know, I publicated the repo. I didn't keep it as a private repo and stuff. So I've got a few, and specifically, I've got a couple of Juice projects on there. I have a couple C++ things that are like maybe single CPP files, which do very basic things. And then I also had some to show, obviously, because I did a lot of DSP as well. I have a bit of MATLAB on the side to show that I can do frequency domain stuff and do Fourier transform. And I understand that. And then, so I wrote the whole three band EQ with MATLAB, which was more work than doing it C++, I think, actually. <laughs> Um, writing a whole like plugin in MATLAB, it's a whole thing, honestly. <laughs> yeah. um, so that that's kind of the the basis of things I've got. It was it wasn't tons. It wasn't you know you don't have to write a hundred things, but having a good juice project and having a couple CPP scripts that do random things, and I think I had some Python stuff on there. Some of my undergrad stuff, which when I was saying I was working with uh, actually I was working with accelerometers and stuff, so some of that which isn't great code, but it's there. So. <laughs> Um, that's interesting. I can I can provide a couple just helping hints from maybe the the company side. Just when it comes to uh, when it comes to code, when it comes to a person's GitHub and what uh, what companies are checking out when it comes to that. Uh, so I mean, first thing, you know, even going wider than that is when somebody tells me that they're a musician. Um, you know, one of the first questions I might ask is, show me some music that you've played, right? So show me some music that you've made. I'm a writer. Show me something that you've written. I'm an audio programmer. Show me something that you've audio programmed. Show me something you've developed. Show me something that you've created, right? If, if, if the person doesn't have any, uh, anything they can show me, it's like, well, it's difficult to really say anything it's really difficult for that conversation to go forward at all right because i don't have anything to um to, to take a look at um so uh another thing that i'll say regarding code so so like harriet was saying just having some code is you don't need to have the most amazing thing uh doesn't need to be the next um hot selling plugin it just needs to be something that's simple that works that demonstrates your coding ability. Um, another thing that I'll say is that the way that you present your code, uh, you know, that your portfolio, so to speak, says a lot. You, there are a lot of even there are a lot of things beyond um, just the code that you write that it says about who you are and what um, what attention that you're paying to the work that you do. For example, does your get does your repository does it have a readme? Does it have a documentation page saying how to build your project or what the project even is? Uh, does it have uh, is the code formatted? Are the names uh, are the names of your variables are they sensible? Um, you know, the, the architecture of your code, like I said, it doesn't need to be software architect level stuff, just the basics, just basic, just basic fundamental principles. You know, so no matter what, no matter what job that you're applying for, so that right now I'm talking about this in the, in the context of software engineering, but you know, if, um, let's say that we were talking about um, you know, quality assurance, being a QA, being a tester, a tester of plugins, testing to see if plugins work properly or not. Then something I might ask is, well, are you a music producer? Are you a musician? Are you a producer? Uh, do you use plugins a lot? You know, if you don't, then I can't, you know, it's very difficult to be a software, to, to be a QA. If you don't, you know, what dolls do you own? Um, uh, you know, have you, uh, do you know how to use it all? Do you know how to use a plugin? Um, 
You know, do you know what the difference is between a good and, and bad sounding plugin? Um, yeah, those are the types of things. So, so it's, it's really about taking the skills that you, that you have and really trying to mold those around the job that you're applying for, you know, and saying, and answering the question, the question, you know, yes, it's a competitive, it's a competitive world out there. Um, you know, there are a lot of people applying. And it goes back to the critical question that Harriet mentioned, why me? Why me and not somebody else? What, a, and, and that's the question that your CV should be answering. Why you? What skills do you have that you're bringing to the team, to the company that are going to make you or me an addition, a positive addition to the team. You know, that's really what it's, that's really what it's all about. It's really that simple. Uh, and the way that you present that information is so critical. You know, like when, uh, you know, Harriet, sent me her CV. I can't remember the specifics of it, but, you know, we talked a lot about just being able to highlight, you know, because with every job, there's a job description, right? And saying the person should, should, uh, you know, know basic C++. The person should have some experience in juice, um, you know, and it goes down the checkline. You know, if I was writing a CV for a position, I would want my CV to go line by line and like basically like a checkbox. Okay. Shows that person knows some C++, you know, has some code that they've written in juice shows that they, that they know how to work nice with other people and uh, you know, play nicely uh, and um, you know, and be cooperative and show up on time and all the things, all the basic things that we, that we, we like when we're working with others, right? For people to be nice, to be kind to each other. Um, you know, so, you know, that's, so, so Valeria, I feel that you're searching a little. And so the question that I want, that the, the question that maybe I would like to ask you is why music, you know, why, you know, what, when you see yourself in a, in a role or in your ideal, you know, in your ideal job heaven, what are you doing day to day? Are you developing? Are you, uh, are you, are you managing? Are you being a QA? Um, what does that, what does that day look like? Right. So maybe I can ask you that right now. What would your ideal day look like? My profile is actually a little bit more than just coding a little bit more than just sure, computer sure. science so for me my ideal scenario is where i do have a lot of collaboration in my day to day um and i've i've gone through a lot of digging and researching this industry so for me i've identified some options that i'm not too sure like what the ratio is coding and something else, mm -hmm. but there it's a ratio and it's not like pure development personally, because I have a degree in law and I enjoy working with people. I enjoy having conversations, not for the sake of having a meeting, but to be productive and to brainstorm and to discuss ideas and things right. like that. So my circumstances, I also imply that I have certain like factors that are kind of shaping my path. And mm -hmm. I think for me, I think it's, it's just an interesting case. For me, I might be able to get into audio in a slightly different, from a slightly different angle, maybe a little yeah. bit later when my circumstances are a little bit different. But but I'm saying outside of outside of developed, just let's let's pretend that we're not talking about audio software development. Let's just pretend we're talking about anything, just talking about getting a job, 
you're you have a job working in a music tech company doing what you mm-hmm. want what is what does that what does that look like what okay so you're having a lot of talks what are those talks about are they about law are they a talk, are they about building a product so tell, tell me more for me i think it'd be about the process so d- defining the strategy that we're all working on the goals that we all have and trying are trying to achieve as a team so i have a lot of interest for project management personally outside of everything and um yeah it's we're deviating from software development a little bit but coding is something i enjoy it's just complex you know but 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 i don't think i don't think the um the software i i think the the ingredients to getting to getting the right job no matter whether it's software development project management being a plumber being a construction worker all of those are essentially the same so it's really so let's you know let's let's just pretend let's just take the software development and just like put it to the side for a second so you have so you have something about you that resonates with music you you like project management you like collaborating with people. So this is good, right? So, so, so you said that you like talking about strategy. So when you say strategy, do you mean the strategy of building a product, the strategy of the way that the business works, the strategy of the way that the people are working together and getting and making that the most effective thing? What do you mean by that? I would say for me, it's probably the scope of a project. So not necessarily company-wide strategy, but perhaps product, uh, the product scope or the project scope. So that's something I am thinking and kind of probably moving towards slowly. And it's a lot of, I enjoy supporting my teams whenever I've been on a team project. I enjoy supporting people who are in the same process and trying to maybe remove some obstacles if there are any obstacles and getting my teams on the same page. So that's just a natural inkling that I get. (laughs) Yeah. So that's, that's really, that's really interesting. So something that you, um, something that, the an idea that you gave me you know that there are people especially in larger companies like ableton for example um where they have somebody this uh, have you ever heard of uh, a role called a scrum master mm-hmm. yeah scrum i was master. just thinking yeah. about it too. <laughs> yeah yeah so are you familiar with what that is yeah 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 right so for for people that that aren't um that maybe aren't familiar with the term so you have this kind of methodology that that people use in a lot of software companies it's called agile project management so at a high level it's the way that that um that larger companies manage their projects and make sure that their that their project is continuously progressing now sometimes you have a company that they actually have a dedicated person that serves as what they call a scrum master. So scrum is a subset of the agile methodology and scrum is, and you have somebody called a scrum master who is dedicated to essentially helping teams work effectively, effectively um, estimating how much time it may take to come to, to, uh, to uh, finish a project, to get to their next milestone. Um, to ensure that the team is working cohesively. I mean, when you're when you're talking about some of these skills, that seems to be what comes to mind for me. Have you thought about looking at that path? Yeah, absolutely. Project management is definitely something I've looked at. <laughs> I just need to um, craft my path wisely and make decisions that make sense long term. So I hope to get there. I really do. Yeah. yeah. It's always a journey, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it, it goes, you know, if you're looking for that type of opportunity, that's fantastic. Um, and that's such a skill. I, I think that 
sometimes I think that finding uh, people who have the skills to assemble a team and to and to get the right team together and to get them working cohesively and to settle um, you know, friction within a team is sometimes more difficult than finding an effective software developer to to actually do a project. It's very difficult to find people who know how to manage teams effectively. Uh, and uh, and if that's the path that you're looking to take, I think that's awesome. Um, you know, it goes back to, but it, it goes back to a lot of the principles that Harriet was talking about, which are, um, which are trying to get involved in a community that really understands that world that really uh, tries to that 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 really um, helps foster your skill set. Um, you know, and uh, like, you know, you may you may ask yourself or people may be asking themselves, well, why, you know, because Harriet said that, you know, I, I had helped mentor her and, and people say, well, why Harriet? And the, the answer to that is because I saw, uh, you know, sometimes I see people in the community and they have this motivation, you know, there's this motivation of, um, you know, I want to learn this curiosity and this drive that I can see within them that says, I want to learn. I want to be good at this thing. Um, I'm willing to, <clears throat> I'm willing to start at ground zero and I'm willing to build this. I'm willing to do the work that it takes to do it, but I really want to be a part of the team. I really want to learn how to, um, how to be an effective part of the team. Um, and I think th when I see that in somebody that really that really motivates me because I feel like okay, you know that person wants to be part of something. They really want to, they really want to make things happen. And sometimes it's just a little from there, you know. Then, then companies or people or mentors can just kind of tweak a little bit and say, okay, well maybe your CV, maybe it'd be a little bit more effective if we did this and switch these two sections around. But the right ingredients were there. It's just needed a little bit of guidance and a little bit of of just being put into the being helped to get into the right place. But all the right ingredients have to be there. You know, like it has to be that I think I think another thing that Harriet had was she had a vision of what she wanted to do. You know, like she had a clear direction. It's like if if I don't have, if I don't know what my ideal day looks like or, uh, you know, where I want to be or what my ideal job is, a company's not going to know either, you know? Um, so it's all about matching what you want with what the company wants. And if you don't, if, if, if you're not quite clear on what you would like that to be, it's very difficult for a company to say, I, I know just the job for you, right? You mm -hmm. have to sit. You know, so, you know, if it's project management, I would like a, what I would what I would ideally like to see is like a strong, clear commitment to um, to project management is what I want to do. This is what I've done to get to this, you know, to 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 become an effective project manager. I've taken these courses. I've done this thing. I'm part of this community. And that's uh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to that's what I'm going to be able to do for, you know, company X. So, um, you know, it's just that clear vision, you know, that I feel that from, from what I'm hearing, I feel that you're, you're still searching a little bit. Um, I'd say a lot of it comes from being an international student and right, right. there yeah. are certain factors that kind of, require you to be strategic and um yeah it's Just challenging it's think challenging. things through yeah 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 it's challenging and and um you know how old are you if you don't mind asking i'm 27 right you're 27 so i mean when i was at 20 when i was at 27 i still didn't really know you know i think we're i, I think in the end we're all still really trying to figure it out uh, you know, like we, it, I think it's very rare when we know 
definitively like that's, um, you know, this is my trajectory. This is my path in life. But that um, I think that, you know, you have to, it, it's important to have an idea of of who you want to be or what you want to apply for. Yeah, because otherwise what happens is that the CV, the CV, you know, gets written and it's like, well, I could be a QA or I could be a project manager. And the the hiring manager says, I, I really don't know what to do. You know, I don't know what to do with this person, you know, because I, if they don't know who they want to be, I can't, I can't tell them, I can't put them somewhere, you know, that knowing, knowing where you knowing where you want to be and what you want to do and having that strong conviction is that's the thing that's going to make you stand out from other people, you know, uh, and, and having just those key ingredients that are saying, that are saying, um, you know, and this is what I've done so far to get there. And I just need a little bit of nudging, but I have the right motivation to do it. Uh, you know, that, that will, uh, that will help. Um, yeah, but you know, there are, there are some other people that have, that have, uh, that have had some, some helpful advice here. So, um, you know, some people are saying, um, you know, attending conferences, attending, <laughs> um, you know, places where you can get guidance on, on some of these, some of these aspects. You also have like program management, technical marketing. Those are other great, um, those are, those are other great roles that that are kind of adjacent, but also within the music tech industry. Um, there are a lot of music jobs that aren't, uh, you know, the, the this channel it's, in itself is very focused on more kind of what you would call pro audio. So audio for like music producers, musicians, um, you know, uh, and so on. But you also have this music space that is not, Pro audio, like companies like Spotify, Bose, um, you know, Amazon, um, loads of companies that are that work within the music space, but not necessarily so technical. Because I I think that's the big thing with pro audio is that it's a very it's a very technical. Um, the the products themselves are very technical, and they get a little bit sometimes they get more into the technical aspects more than the, the I'm, I'm getting the impression that you really like the user, the user aspect of it, the user experience aspect of it um, and the, and the team building. So um, yeah, that's, uh, I know that we got a little bit off topic, but I, I, I hope that some of that might be a little bit, has, has that been helpful for you at all? I would say so, yeah. And it's interesting what I've learned over the past year is that audio has so many different dimensions to it. The audio industry, like you said, and there are many different positions within this industry, whether it's pro audio or tech companies in the audio space. So you just have to like search a little bit. <laughs> And find what works and find what makes sense. I am, that's the thing, my case, I'm very interested in audio and I'm like, I do sound art and I enjoy working with sound on a very low level. Mm -hmm. um, but professionally, I just, I think I would really enjoy working on a project management side just because I could implement my, natural like willingness to be helpful for other people and be supportive with others mm -hmm. so yeah that's good that's good uh, and and i think that that's a great piece of advice that you've given that you've maybe even given to yourself which is knowing yourself you know once mm -hmm. you know what you're good at and um you know what what resonates with you and what doesn't resonate with you so you know that you like working with people. So, you know, by, uh, by contrast, you know, that sitting in a room and coding in C++ all day does not resonate with you, for example. Coding so, is lovely though. Coding is lovely. I love it. I really do enjoy it. I get in the flow with 
the process when like I know what I'm working on and stuff. And I also came across different roles that have that ratio of coding and project management, even depending on the company, like solutions engineers I've heard have, mm-hmm. depending on where you are, it could be both. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I can I can speak a little bit on one of the. I mean, I have a couple different. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time. Well, what do you do? You know, what do I do for a job? One of the jobs that I do is I I um I actually manage an agency and direct an agency where we actually build products for for people, and um so I talk with a lot of clients. I talk uh you know talk with them about what they want what type of product that they want to build and uh, what their vision is. And then there has to be a translation layer between that and what um, what the audio developers are actually doing. So it goes from the vision of the client over to um, the specification that the audio developers need to build. Then it's about, well, how do you get the right audio developers with the right skills into the same room, into the same group, getting them to get along with each other, getting them to understand the specification and, um, and building that team. I mean, that's kind of what I do. I don't actually develop or code or, I mean, I code, I I do code um, and I can write code, but having that, having that knowledge of being in the, and being able to take um, a vision from somebody that has never written a line of code and taking your knowledge of code and what, and the ability, uh, the abilities that that has and being able to help come up with a specification with the audio developers or with the team, that is a skill right there. That is a skill. Um, and it's, there are, it's, it's, it's a tough skill because like you said, you need to have that hybrid technical knowledge, but also the knowledge to, to work with people. And, and if you, if you feel that and you resonate with that, I encourage you to push on that and to, mm. and, and, to and to keep pursuing that path. That sounds, that sounds very promising. Yeah. I'm excited for what the future holds really truly. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, then it's from there, it's trying to, it could be just trying to get a team together to, to build something, build something simple. Like I said before, um, then it becomes a proof of work, you know, look, you know, I helped, I helped assemble this product. I helped, I helped to take this vision and realize this product, this open source project and take it to, um, you know, take it to this milestone. Then that becomes the work that you've done and the proof that you can do that thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I appreciate um, your input. Yeah, no, no problem. And um, you know, yeah, I'm I'm happy to help. And um, you know, you can always reach out, reach out to me, reach out to the community, but. Um, you know, I understand it. it is challenging. The first step is really getting, showing this is what you, um, you know, this is what you want to do and trying to do something very simple. Like it's kind of like a proof of concept, you mm-hmm. know, proof of concept, like developing something, developing something simple and, mm-hmm. uh, and taking that forward. Yeah. What do you, That's what really do you think? About that? Thank you. What do you think of that, Harriet? Spot on the money. <clears throat> Thanks for saying so lovely about my uh, CV as well. <laughs> um, I think it's true. I think, honestly, you don't need to know specifically what career path you want to go down. It's it's more about figuring it out and pushing yourself to do that. So, like, I didn't know for a while if I wanted to be a musician or a programmer. And then I was like, actually, I really like problem solving. I like my day-to-day day to be that problem solving thing. I like... Mm-hmm would like my guitar playing to be my hobby again. I, I, I despise playing the guitar and I, it got to a point where I was only doing it when I was being paid and it's not fun, it's, it's not good. Um, so that's what led me down coding specifically. Um, 
and also like the volunteer work fulfills me as well like running dynamic cast and making that change and running those workshops and stuff so yeah it's all right to not know yet as well maybe just try things out and see what works yeah yeah trying things out but when but when you're in front of you know if you're going to adc for example this year and you and you're introducing yourself to to people and they say that they're hiring you have to be able to tell them where you want to be if it's if it's project manager you have to say hey i'm really looking to take a path in project management and i'd love to be able to discuss how i could how i could help your team with my skill set you know it has to be that you know it has to be kind of you have to tell them where where what skill set you have mm -hmm. yeah that was my first adc experience i just got went up to people and was like i want to be a programmer how right what what would make you hire me what are the code interviews like what can i do like just yeah figuring it out yeah and like like harriet said the, the people are so people are so open about it and um and you know very willing to give contribute their knowledge and we've had a couple talks uh here on the channel as well so we've had a talk with um gerhard bellis who's the who's the owner and ceo of of ableton um you know um, he talks a little bit about some of the qualities that he looks for when um when his team are hiring uh also we've had um kevin molkard uh who is um, I think it's VP of engineering now for Arturia in France. You know, he talks about some of the same things. Um, but yeah, um, I think, I think like Harriet was saying, you just gotta, you just gotta get out there and show people what you got. You know, uh, show people your enthusiasm for, if it's project management, then project management. Yeah. Um, because I, I felt like you were getting some really positive energy and some excitement, you know, when you were talking about that collaboration and, um, you know, helping people to realize a vision that sounds, that sounds exciting. I, yeah, that's true. And the thing with collaboration is that I think the best things come out of interdisciplinary work. That's my conviction. And I would want to, like help have more of that in the world, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. I think that that's, um, I think that that's awesome. Like, like we were saying, just knowing just that knowledge of where you want to be and what you want to be doing is, is great. You know, it's a great start and it's a great way to get those conversations started with people. You know, if you're talking with somebody from Ableton and you say, well, I really like, working with teams, helping to get people into the right place, you know, helping to, you know, finalize and direct a vision. I mean, all of those things are great things that, um, that, that companies look for. It's just not always clear how to get there, especially when you, that's just been my experience when you're in, when you are in a computer science program, Oftentimes people think that they just, they only have one option, I guess. Hmm. That's not really the case. And I went into computer science thinking computer science is a tool and you can be really creative with that tool, you know? And I definitely would never want to like give up my like appreciation and my desire to code and learn how to get better at it because it's a tool and you can solve cool problems with it, but yeah. context can be so diverse depending on the person. I think it's something that I would want to also share with the world, like find the context that you want to be in and mm -hmm. go there. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be FinTech necessarily. It doesn't have to be big tech at all. <laughs> it could be something different. Yeah. Well, well, there, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of companies that I know that they really appreciate if a person who's working in project management or working in people management, um, 
are able to talk about coding or have at least the most basic knowledge about coding and, and being able to do that. So that, that skill that you have is definitely something that is definitely an attribute, definitely an advantage. And I would, and, and I would definitely emphasize that, you know, in your, in your CV, you know, if you want to be a project manager and you have that background and you have that experience with coding, that's like I was saying, one of those things that helps answer the question, well, why me? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you know, yeah, it's a journey. It's a journey for sure. But, um, you know, and, and a lot of the questions that I, some of the questions that I think that you may be asking are questions that you, that you have to like, it's, it's like, you have to build part of that yourself. I think that that's the missing I think that that's the missing piece there is that you have to have something that's like I said, like some sort of proof of concept to show that you have at least the most basic level of competence when it comes mm -hmm. to project management, when it comes to managing a project that always helps. Yeah. I think that's the most, uh, that's the most important thing because even as students, we we focus too much on resume. Resume is just one part of the application. It's just one part of your profile. Right. And but if if all they have is your resume to go off of, that's all they have, right? Yeah. You know, if you have if you have uh, like you were saying that you that you're starting up a project uh, a, a podcast, I think that's awesome because. Mm -hmm. Once again, it's like people just need to see what is it like to be to work with Valeria, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know what is that what is that experience going to be like? Um, the more evidence that you have to support that, whether it's just a resume, whether it's um, an interaction that you've had with with a person at at ADC or a conference, um, whatever it is, everything is supporting information, you know, and if you have a podcast, if you have content that you're, that you're doing that, that you're creating, once again, it's not just about the content. It's like people get an idea of like, what is it like to work with this person? What is it like to be around this person? You know, what is this, how does this person think? The more of that, that you have, the more that you, the more that a company can really look and say, um, yeah, you know, this seems like Valeria would be a fantastic person for our team. Mm -hmm. I think this is really helpful for anybody who's watching, even if they do focus on technical roles, like entirely technical roles, because we can't overlook that because you will be working with other people. We all will be working with other people. And I think it's really good advice. So thank you for that. No problem. I'm glad to help. And like I said, you can, you can reach out anytime. Um, and, um, I'm happy to, I'm happy to help out, you know, like if you have a yeah. CV that you want that you wanted to say, you know, I'm not sure. What do you think? I'm applying for this job. You know, here's the job role. Here's my CV. What do you think? Um, you know, I'm happy to have a look over it and, and give you some, um, you know, my feedback. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been great. <laughs> I'm glad. Marcus, I feel like we've left you out. No, no, I've uh, I've, I've been nodding my head like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I love the career career advice. Um, uh, a lot of Valeria, some of what you said really resonated with me. Like uh, I really like that word uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, that's a really key word for me. I, uh, I, I feel like um, folks, uh, like I've worked with a lot of product managers and project managers with software backgrounds and that software informing them uh, made them more effective uh, at, at those other uh, parts of their role. Uh, so I feel like software is going to help you no matter what, whether it's purely technical, whether it's, it's uh, you know, some, some other role. Uh, but I, I love that word inter interdisciplinary because uh, you're just going to keep learning and growing and you're, you're not going to do the same thing, uh, you know, tomorrow that you're going to do in 10 years. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. These things become, like you were saying, experiences that build on each other. You know, like yeah. a lot, of, a lot of what I do now actually stems from 
uh, you know, my experience as a mental health counselor 20 years ago, uh, over 20 years ago. And I never thought that it'd be something that would come back, uh, back, back to me, but it ended up being a, uh, a critical part of my personal journey. Uh, and, um, you know, even the struggles, you know, there were, there were a lot of struggles that I dealt with, uh, before I started the audio programmer and went back to university and, um, but those struggles ended up becoming, um, you know, really key insights. They really actually became, if I didn't have those struggles, then the audio programmer wouldn't have become what it is. You know, it's life has this funny sense of irony sometimes. Uh, so it's a journey. So um, <laughs> somebody says, what does chat GPT have to say about all this? <laughs> Almost afraid to ask. Don't trust it. <laughs> Verify. <laughs> Uh, so great. I think, uh, is there anything else that we should discuss? I think, I think that this may be a good time, a good organic way to, uh, to conclude today. Any, any further thoughts, uh, Valeria, Harriet? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. I feel, it feels like such a surreal moment to be on this stream because it has been a crucial part of my process. Like finding this community and uh, reaching out to people and learning about what's out there. And I'm not giving up on this by any means. I'm using all of this in my other projects. So I'm very appreciative and happy about this opportunity. So thank you. That's awesome. I'm glad to, glad to help. Glad that it's been um, really helpful. And thank you for sharing as well. You know, like you've, had um you know the the courage to get here online and basically you know share your experience and you know share that share that with the world and you know with scars and all and uh that takes a lot of courage so thank you as well um i think that you'll find that um you will you, you know some of the things that you've said here will inspire others inspire others to um take certain actions and inspire others to ask questions as well. So you will be a, uh, you're going to be an inspiration for other people as well. Cool. So with that, I think we can go ahead and conclude. Uh, I always, every month that I do this, I always forget to get the, uh, the next date for the next meetup. Uh, so it's going to be the 11th of July. And, um, and we've already got our guests for next month and they're going to be very exciting. So we're going to be journeying into the world of web audio and um, and also into uh, the world of AI next month. And we will um, be announcing our speakers uh, in probably the next week or two. So uh, very exciting. Once again, uh, if you found this beneficial or if you want to learn more about audio programming, uh, please join our Discord group. Uh, it's a free way to uh, to get in touch with other other people who are in this career uh, in this career field. People of all different types of levels and experiences, um, and you know, it's something that I built as a person who is just getting into the industry, looking for that guidance, trying to understand more about that world, uh, trying to understand more about this industry that we work in, and helping to you know, pull back the curtain on this. So uh, I think that it's been, uh, it's, it's been a successful initiative so far and we, we still have a long way to go. Um, so thank you to everybody who uh, tuned in, uh, join our discord group, join us July 11th for our next uh, audio programmer meetup. And until then uh, we will see you next time. Thank you once again. Thanks Josh. Thank you. All right, great.